Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. You might remember this ZX81 from the previous video in which we applied a composite video mod. Here it is, this is the board that we fitted. If you missed that video, I'm going to play it for you now. Alright, now we're all up to speed. I did mention in the video that the board stopped working, although we did get there and achieve this beautiful composite video signal, there was a big issue along the way which I didn't go into. So here's a little look at what happened when I first plugged it in. Not very good at all really, we're gonna have to fix it. Yeah, it caught me off guard this one, I did think it was all working perfectly, but here we go in slow motion, you can see that just after maybe 15 or 20 seconds of being plugged in, it all falls over in a catastrophic failure. The fact that it takes a little while to fall over suggests it's to do with heat, and I'm reckoning something like one of these five chips is falling over once it gets a bit too warm. But we're not going to jump to any conclusions just yet, let's do some simple checks, starting with the 5 volt supply coming out of the voltage regulator. Now I'm holding the multimeter to it while the machine is running until the machine falls over to see if anything happens with the voltage, so let's speed up time and the machine's fallen over around about here and the voltage was still within tolerance although watching that back I noticed it was slowly falling but maybe that's normal for a machine which is still warming up I don't know maybe I just learned something let me know in the comments if you know I also wanted to check the clock going into the Z80 make sure that it hasn't fallen over and that could be the cause of our problem the voltage was between 0 and 5 which is right let's look under the scope and it's a 3.22 megahertz clock signal, 5 volts high just about, so no problems there. I wanted to check that because it might have helped me to understand where the fault lies. Uh, if we look at the schematic here, we can see we have a green crystal in the middle, X1. This dictates the frequency of the ULA IC1's internal clock, which is then divided by 2 and sent back out to clock the CPU. It's no coincidence that it's double the CPU frequency. Turns out this is very useful in the design of the video circuitry of the ULA, as I've been reading about recently with a project in mind. Keep an eye out for that. Anyway, the ULA divides its clock by two and sends it out on pin 14 towards the CPU. I've highlighted this orange, it goes into TR2, the base of TR2, which serves as an amplifier to give us a nice five volt square-ish form clock into our CPU on pin six. I'm showing the output of pin 14 here as low, so TR2 is closed and we get a nice 5 volts via R5 into our clock signal input on pin 6 of the CPU. If the output of pin 14 of the ULA goes high here, we can see that TR2 conducts and 5 volts is drained via R5 to ground, we get 0 volts on our clock input on pin 6 of the CPU. Anyway, so I was interested in if that clock had stopped clocking, because that may have suggested that our ULA was at fault, which would have been bad. Thinking about it a little further, we were still getting white paper, so the ULA probably isn't at fault here. So let's get the heat gun out and preheat this heatsink at gas mag 6, so we can pop it on our two major chips, the ULA and the Z80 in turn, preheat them, plug it in and see how long it takes for the machine to fall over. There we are, that's feeling pretty warm. Let's lob it on top of the ULA, give it a minute to preheat and plug it in and see what happens. Okay, it's booted up okay. We've got our cursor with that K in the black box there. We'll fast forward a bit and we can see at 17 seconds it fell over. Not as catastrophically as before, but I think that's nothing to read into. Next up, we will preheat the Z80. I've allowed the ULA to cool back down again and I've got a nice hot Z80 here. I'll plug it in and see what happens. And well, nothing happened. Nothing came on the screen at all. So I'm going to let it cool a little bit and repeat the test. And I couldn't even move the camera fast enough. It died after about one second with this lovely pattern of noise. So we're definitely suspecting the Z80 is where the problem lies. I've allowed the machine to cool down again completely and I've plugged it in and once again we got to about 17 seconds before it fell over. 
so I'm definitely suspicious of the Z80. I'm just going to do one more round, I'm going to double bake it and see what happens, maybe I've missed something, I just want to double check. So let's plug it in, and once again no picture, I've got nothing to show you, so here's my cat. It's time to get the solder pump out and get this Z80 out. I can see that it's already been replaced once, there's flux all over it. So this board hasn't had much luck with its CPUs. And well, let's get this replaced anyway, because we're pretty confident that it's broken. No, I still haven't bought a desolder gun. I spent the money instead on a toast rack on eBay that I'm going to repair. And I'm going to try and fit an internal HDMI port to it. So that's going to be fun. Stay tuned for that. Here's a picture of the failure mode from the eBay listing. What do you reckon? I reckon CPU or ROM. What do you think? Comment below. Let me know. Speaking of busted CPUs, I've got this one out now. Here we go. Lovely. And we're going to tidy up these joints and put a new one in. If the joints aren't clear, I just touch them with the end of a hot soldering iron and it all becomes nice and open for our socket to go in. And you definitely should put a socket in to save future rework. My first mistake with this repair was to not do that. For some reason I had it in my head that they don't fit in the ZX81. In fact they do. More about that later. Anyway here's the new Z80 going in without a socket. Whoops a daisy. Oh well it should be fine it's a new CPU right? Let's solder it in. So what else can we talk about? Oh yeah, take a look at this, how close are we to 2,000 subscribers? That's going to be a huge milestone, we've been gradually growing the channel over the years. And those of you who've been with me since 1,000 subscribers may remember that we had a celebratory live stream where we had a chaos battle and each of you gave me the name of a wizard and we put them all against each other in a battle and the ultimate winner from all, I think it was 24, 32 people who gave me wizard names won a ZX Spectrum. Wow. So I'm going to do that again at 2000 subscribers. This isn't the announcement so don't be putting your wizard names in the chat yet but keep an eye out for it because we're probably only a couple of months away. I don't know yet what I will give away to the winner but let's see. Don't miss this one. Click subscribe if you're not already subscribed because I'll be mentioning it in another video soon. So I fitted the new Z80. I'm going to plug it in and it's going to work. No it's not, it didn't work and what you're seeing now is fast forwarded flapping. I don't know what's going on, I'm fiddling around with it wondering if I've missed something, but no it's just not working. I'm going to assume that the Z80 is working because it's brand new and something else has fallen over now that this new Z80 is in there. I'm having a look here at the clock signal again, in fact let's have a look in a bit more detail because I'm interested in this circuit. The bottom left there shows the clock going to the CPU, the middle left is the clock generated by the ULA and the top left shows us the oscillator going into pin 35 of the ULA. So green, there we are, 6.22 MHz I was measuring. I've had to doctor these images because my scope wasn't set up right, but that's close to 6.5. I assume the difference is just because of my cheap scope. And it's not a nice 5 volt wave, that's just the way it is inside the ULA that gets turned into a clock signal which is usable via a complicated arrangement of transistors. Orange shows us the output on pin 14 which is heading towards the CPU. It's 3.36 volts. Um, I didn't have the scope set right. I didn't have 10 times on. Uh, but it's not a perfect square wave so that goes to TR2 which produces the red signal bottom left there which is much closer to a nice driven 5 volt square wave. Is this interesting? Yes. Is it useful? No. I just wanted to check on another machine that the input to the ULA was not a square wave and it's not. I learned something there. Um, so yeah, that line investigation didn't really take us anywhere. So at this point I started scoping all of the pins of the Z80 and the ULA looking for anything strange. And did I find anything strange? Yes, I did. A bunch of the address lines on the Z80 pins at least were noisy ground just nothing look that's that's not an address signal so I've definitely found some kind of a fault the next step is to try and pin down where the fault is coming from the Z80 produces these address signals but doesn't necessarily mean the Z80 is at fault another component on the board could be pulling it down to ground so I've picked one I've picked A7 and I'm going to start disconnecting that from various chips on the board starting with the ULA it's pin 1 of the ULA 
Don't worry, we're not going to bend the pin, we're just going to take the solder out of the joint. So I'm using my meter on continuity mode and I'm pushing the pin around until there's no beep while I'm touching the leg, then I know it's clear of the joint. It is a bit of a fine art this, but it works. I'm now having another look at A7 with pin 1 of the ULA isolated from it and it's still stuck down at ground. So that's pretty good, I think that means the ULA is probably okay. What's next? The ROM chip is also attached to A7, so let's isolate that pin in the same way. And repeating the test, A7 is still not working, so we can exclude the ROM chip. Hmm, what does that leave? Let's have a look at the schematic. I've highlighted A7 so we can see all the chips that it touches. Note that in the top right there, we either have IC4 or IC4A and 4B. On this particular board, we've got 4A and 4B, so deleted IC4. We've excluded the ULA as the problem. We've excluded the ROM chip as the problem. So let's zoom into what's left. We've got the CPU and the two RAM chips. So logically, we're going to check out these RAM chips next. I'm going to continue this style of investigation by isolating A7 on those two chips, starting with this one that happens to be on the right hand side. And we still haven't recovered A7, so that just leaves one more chip, which I'm really hoping is the problem. Let's isolate A7 from the other RAM chip, the last remaining chip on the board, get the probe on, and it's still not working. Which only leaves us with the Z80. Is it possible that my new Z80 I put in doesn't work? Oh dear. You'll remember that I didn't socket it, so I'm going to have to rework it again, which is bad. Rework is bad, so I always put a socket in if it will fit. Okay, well let's get it out and let's put a socket in and see what happens. Fortunately, it came out without any protests, so the rework hasn't caused any problems, and we can put in a brand new socket. And who forgot, I nearly did, we need to stitch up all of these A7 joints, all four of them. And here's another Z80, and I know that this one works, let's take a look, let's see if we're finally there. Cool, it's booted up this time, so I must have just put in a bad Z80. I let it run for a while just to make sure that the old crashing issue didn't come back, and when it didn't, I knew we'd fixed it and I could continue with the composite video mod testing, as you saw in the previous video. Now that just about concludes the repair of this ZX81. Check out the other video if you haven't already. And as I mentioned, keep an eye out for live streams coming up. We've been having some fun playing Jet Set Willy, and we'll definitely be having the Chaos Battle at 2,000 subscribers with some prizes to give away. Thanks everyone for watching. Please drop a like and please share with your friends. And I'll see you in the next video.